and you see the horn button <coughs> then you have a headlight switch that would be high beam low beam and parking lights over here outside of that you have a spark advance lever because automatic spark advance was not really on the market yet so yeah horn lights spark advance and throttle um, okay i'll just start it up for a second so so we are looking at a 1931 studebaker dictator regal the dictator name sounds a little odd in these days but back in the early 30s that wasn't a bad word not until a guy in italy and a guy in germany started acting up way back most cars you had a chev you had a ford you had a plymouth whatever a secondary name was unheard of other than some of the smaller companies like stutz had a black hawk and a bearcat jordan playboy was kind of a famous one to old car aficionados but most cars didn't have a secondary name so studebaker started and they had basically three classes they had the president which was the big luxury car they had a commander which was a middle range one and they had the dictator which was the sort of junior model this is the dictator it's uh built in walkerville ontario which is now part of windsor and there's a plate on the door post that says that it was made in Walkerville. It's an all original car, not a lot of big features on this. The Regal is the upper end of this model, so it comes with side mount spares, which gives you six wheels. The standard car had five, the spare was hanging on the back. And because this is a Regal with the side mounts, it also has a trunk rack and it has a trunk which is removable, so you could take it in your hotel room with you if you so desired. <laughs> Apparently, which not, wasn't all that uncommon back in the day, that you would unstrap the trunk and probably a valet would carry the trunk up to your room and then they'd reinstall it in the morning when you're ready to hit the road again. It was pretty shabby when I got it. It had been the owner I bought it from called it the Moose Hotel. So I had to reupholster the car and the paint was terrible. There was uh, The body wasn't in bad shape other than the paint was badly deteriorated and some corrosion and cracks on the fenders. So that's been repaired and I did this car, I would say approximately 10 years ago. The body off the frame, pretty well rebuilt everything. So it's a nice working car. It's kind of fun to drive. Although all these old cars with bias ply tires, they tend to follow the cracks in the road. They rattle and squeak and jump around. They're nothing at all like a modern day car. More fun to look at than to drive, I would say. Now, of course, 31, the depression was starting to get quite well underway. In order to try to get more appeal to the customers or whatever, they redesigned the car somewhat mid-year. So this is a late model car. This was built pretty well at the end of the production of 31. Mid-year, they went from metal wood, uh, metal window garnishes that were grain painted. They went to actual mahogany wood casings on the inside. They installed silk blinds in the back three windows, the rear window and the two short side windows. They put a center armrest in. They put a chrome strip down the center of the hood. The trunk brackets are chromed. Those were sort of the mid-year changes to make the car a little more appealing and apparently either held the price or maybe even reduced the price lately. So likely not making a lot of money on cars at that point because they were trying to keep the factory busy and keep their name out in the public. A lot of people when I'm at car shows and so on, they notice the fabric insert in the roof and they say, oh, is that an opening top or something? And no, that's a fixed feature. And in fact, until 1935, I don't think there were any cars that didn't have a fabric insert in the roof. The reason being, you have to consider that Cars were an evolution of a horse-drawn buggy, and when they started making automobiles, they got bigger, quite a lot bigger than the typical riding wagon or enclosed wagon. They didn't have stamping presses that could press a sheet of metal big enough to make a roof. There's actually a wood frame inside of that roof, and the fabric insert, it's sort of interesting how it's made. There are little hardwood slats that go across between the two metal side rails and then there's chicken wire on top of that and then there's a layer of cotton and then a piece of canvas and then the what they call patent leather which was a sort of a, a forerunner of vinyl i would say yeah that's pretty standard equipment until i think i'm correct that general motors was the first one to come out with an all steel roof and that was in 1935. yeah i don't know other features on the car mechanical brakes they're cable operated on all four wheels they're Pretty conventional drum brakes, which was quite standard on all cars up until disc brakes became more popular in the late 70s or so. Six volt 
electrical system, which doesn't give you real brilliant headlights, but then again, you typically didn't drive much over about 35 miles an hour back in those times. Paved roads were a rarity, and typically on dirt roads, you weren't going all that fast at night anyway. A lot, a lot of safety features. No collapsible steering column. In fact, the, the steering column is a solid rod right down to the front axle. The, there's no seat belts. There's no rear view mirrors other than one little one in the center. The, the ones that are on the spare tires are an add-on, would, wouldn't have been original. I did that for my own safety. And of course, no signal lights. Again, I have signal lights on this car for safety because I like to be able to take it out on the road and people don't know what hand signals mean anymore. So that's about the only modernization would be the side mirrors and the, and the signal lights. Everything else, the old fashioned six volt generator, six volt ignition system, very basic automobile as compared to today. That's it. That's it? I think.